Welcome to this session titled Analysis of Social Networks of Educators, Empirical Findings, Practical Application, New Directions, and Theoretical Issues. I'm Min Sun from Virginia Tech, and in theory, welcome all of you to attend this late afternoon session. And if you need to drink coffees or teas, so feel free to do that. Uh, <laughs> and, um, Collectively, we have uh, four papers for this session, and we will review empirical studies that use social network analysis to study how educators are influenced by their networks and how they select with whom to interact. And we will also review studies that discuss using social network analysis to examine uh, the central office administrators as they engage research in district-wide reform and identify the locations of expertise needed to implement the next generation of science standards. Also, this session, we will discuss uh, the new directions for network analysis in education studies and discuss some challenges as well. And we, as I mentioned, we have four papers. Uh, what I'm gonna do, I will introduce the presenters and lead authors for each of the paper, and then uh, let the presenters introduce their uh, co-authors. Uh, so the first paper, led by uh, Dr. Ken Frank from Michigan State University, uh, he will lead the discussion on what we know about teacher and administrator networks, replicated fundings, and recent extensions. Um, then following Ken's discussion, Alan Daly from uh, University of uh, California, San Diego, and Carol Finnick from University of Rochester, they will lead the discussion on challenges, changes, and turn, uh, longitudinal social network perspective of urban district leadership. And after that, following that will be uh, Dr. James Belong from University of uh, from Northwestern University uh, lead the discussion on realizing the potential of social network analysis in education research and development. Um, our last presenter, um, but not least, uh, Dr. Uh, Bill Panil from University of Colorado Boulder will lead the discussion on using network ideas to enhance research use in planning for and supporting education change. Uh, we have our distinguished discussant, Dr. Cynthia Coburn from Northwestern University, will discuss the connections between all these four papers. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor to Dr. Ken Frank. Um, so to start off with, I want to thank my colleague Barbara Schneider, uh, the current president of ARA. Well, I should say as of 24 hours ago, the current president of ARA. Uh, she, she stepped down. You know, it's, the baton has been passed. But she initiated this session, um, and she's been real supportive and, and, and uh, helpful in getting things organized. So I credit to her. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about what we know about uh, teacher ne and, and administrator networks. Uh, I'm going to emphasize replicated findings and, recent, and some recent extensions, but I, I'm going to start off with a bit of a historical view. And, and you know, I, I come, I'm going to come across like the grand man of network analysis, which I'm not. Um, but I do have a little bit of perspective coming from uh, the sociolo sociology side. And I wrote a review piece uh, a few years ago and so just to give us a sense of where we've come from before we move forward, I put this slide up here, and it's certainly not comprehensive. But the basic uh, idea is that there were kind of two strands of work uh, occurring in network analysis um, uh, in the, uh, or before the 90s uh, that would be relevant for what we're doing today. The first strand would be uh, some work done in organizational theory, 
uh, primarily by sociologists, people in business schools. They would feature someone like Mark Ranavet, a very prominent name in network analysis, Ron Burt, Andy Vandeveen, David Cracker, people like that. So they're doing work in organizational theory. Uh, there is a great tradition of network analysis in educational research, uh, really starting with Jacob Marino, but then uh, Coleman, Jim Coleman, putting a profound point on it, uh, along with Maureen Hallinan and Joyce Epstein. So that's all chugging along uh, through the 1970s, 1980s, even into the 1990s. But what you don't really have a lot of is research on teacher networks. So the network stuff in education has to do with students. The network stuff uh, having to do with uh, organizations uh, doesn't have to do with teachers. So then somewhere around the mid-1990s, um, Noah Friedkin and uh, Christian Sl uh, no, Thomas Slater, I think, uh, I'm not sure Slater's last, first name. Friedkin and Slater have a nice piece um, about uh, network centrality and how that affects outcomes in sociology of education. Um, Noah Friedkin's doing some other stuff with Scott Thomas. Uh, I did uh, uh, some pieces in the mid-90s which were really methodological pieces that sort of happened to use teacher networks. But not just happened, because Charles Bidwell was in my ear, you know, saying these are really important. Jeff Yasumoto is doing some things. And this is a very Chicago-centric, I know, view of things. I'm sure there was more done with uh, network analysis and teachers, but there really wasn't a lot, is the point, as of the mid-1990s. And then, um, after somewhere around the mid-2000s, you really get sort of, I must call it a burst of work on teacher networks that's now, if, if this part was Chicago-centric, this burst is coming from all over the place, uh, which is really exciting. And, and I, we, Min and I have tried to do a pretty good review of what's going on. It involves a lot of the people on this stage. Uh, so, um, you know, and, and, and the work starts popping up, uh, you know, having to do with uh, diffusion of innovations, but uh, all sorts of other things. Um, and, and so it's great to have the other people here on this stage who, you know, we're at this point in the, in the field where um, we're, we're, we've sort of arrived, maybe not fully, but I think in retrospect, when we look back 10 years from now, we're going to say roughly mid to late 1990s, it was really coming around, and then you get this coalescing session uh, here in, in 2014. So that was the point I wanted to make. I also wanted to give credit to some people in the background who are kind of pushing, as well as Barbara Schneider, but Lauren Resnick's in the background here, Tony Breich, Adam Gamran, Steve Brownbush, Andy Porter. A lot of these people, if they're not doing explicit network analyses themselves, um, are really egging us on and saying it's really important um, and, and, and paving the way. Uh, and so this is just a quick reference to the piece I wrote in 1998. There's also historically been some work around social networks that I wouldn't say explicitly is, is networky, uh, and it would have to do with things like having to do with teacher climate, uh, culture of schools. I've listed some of the people up there who would deal with it, relationship to leadership and implementation of leadership. A lot of that work would refer to network concepts, but it's not explicitly networky. I note it here. But uh, I'm not going to review it in, in, in as much detail because they're not really doing social network analysis. And the theme of this session is really you know, when you have network data, who's talking to whom and how that's affecting behaviors. Um, but it is related to, to the work that we're doing here. Okay. So I want to lay a little bit of the groundwork here. Why, why are teacher networks so important? You know, So, oh, it's this fad. Uh, we could walk away from it. So why should we even bother with this network stuff? Um, and so I think the driving force in education, but also other areas, has to do with the fact that um, teachers need local knowledge for teaching. Uh, what they do is very complex. And uh, if, if they, they could just invent everything themselves, which is possible, but very inefficient, or they could talk to the person next door uh, who can help them accomplish their teaching goals. So that's a real important reason why local, why network analysis is important because if I'm going to get knowledge from the person next door, my knowledge source might not be the same as your knowledge source, and that can lead to differences in behaviors. All right, good. Um, the networks also enable local coordination. So uh, even if I've got a good knowledge source and you've got a good knowledge source, we're both good teachers, we know what we're doing, imagine me teaching a whole language one year and you emphasizing basic skills the next. The poor eight-year-old who transfers from my 
classroom to yours is going to have a very difficult time of it. And so we want some coordination mechanism in the school. We can think of this as an administrator uh, doing it by fiat, but typically more than local networks allow for coordination or facilitate it. Uh, the last is uh, uh, if we have networks, people, people can learn to talk about their knowledge better. And that can be a knowledge source that can be conveyed even beyond the realm of the particular school. <clears throat> An implication of this, and I'm going to try to draw other implications as we go, is that there are times when networks won't matter as much. And if you're dealing with something that is, uh, does not have to be locally adapted or coordinated, such as a scripted curriculum, the networks might not matter. People could pull that off without talking to their neighbors. And so not, we would not look for network dynamics in those instances. OK, we'll just have a little bit of fun graphically here. This is often the conceptualization of a teacher. And you don't need networks if this is what teaching's about. But teaching is a lot more complicated than that. Um, you've got all sorts of factors figuring in, student composition, the need to coordinate the principal, accountability. And given this, it needs to be locally adapted. And given the need for local adaptation, the networks are going to matter. OK. <clears throat> From the individual perspective, why do networks matter? And our answer is really uh, came out of a piece I wrote in 2010. Teachers want to do two things. They want to do well, and they want to fit into their schools. Uh, in order to do well, they need the local knowledge. And, and so therefore, they're going, to tap, they're going to rely on the networks. In order to, but they need to also fit into their schools. It's very difficult to go to work every day uh, being the lone outsider who can't get help in an emergency or something like that. Uh, so we kind of represent this uh, with the utility framework. And the basic idea here is that um, a teacher has to use, has to have some way of filtering these others' expectations and their own perceptions about efficacy. And as they, they have sort of a utility, which one's more important to them, and that utility determines their action. Uh, in this case, to teach, emphasize whole language or phonics. So the idea is the teacher's got these goals. And these goals are going to implicate the networks. They're going to turn, make her turn to networks. All right, so now I'm going to turn to kind of what we know about networks from, uh, from some existing studies. Not all of these are replication studies, but I have tried to emphasize them. So the first thing is, we, when we look for net network effects on teachers, we typically find small to moderate effects. Uh, so these are not home run effects. Uh, it, it's not necessarily the dominant factor explaining any teacher's behavior. And yet, they're pervasive. They won't go away. You know, gee, networks seem to affect the way teachers teach math, how they use technology. A little, to a moderate amount. Uh, a research implication of that is don't go in with small sample sizes, uh, because it'll be difficult to detect them. The second is that the speed of diffusion really matters. Some things go much faster than others. Um, technology, use of technology can move very quickly. Uh, a change in a teacher's level of trust of her members of her school is not going to change in six months very much. Uh, and so you would want to time a study according to the expected rate of change. The diffusion it will depend on a number of factors. In general, it's the resources allocated. The more resources you allocate to a diffusion process, the quicker things will go. Um, if we have shared contexts uh, for interacting, common language for interaction, uh, those things can all make it go faster. One thing that we found, a number of studies have found, that the people who benefit most from the networks might be ahead in their implementation of a particular innovation. It's hard to be out there on the edge if you don't have support and people who can interact with you. Uh, and, and, and so people tend to fall back in their implementation of reforms or new behaviors if they don't have that support. Good. Um, we're also starting to learn about how teachers choose with whom to at, interact. And uh, grade level and subject are very important. Now, that might not seem like rocket science. Um, yeah, sure, teachers interact with other members of their grade. But an implication of that is th these studies that I've said here refer to change over time. And that means that interactions will become increasingly concentrated within grades unless you do something about it, or within subjects, unless you do something about it. Uh, and so that's pretty striking. There's a very strong effect of the formal organization on shaping interactions. Uh, it also depends on formal positions. Um, leaders can broker interactions. Formal leaders, um, uh, uh, yeah, for formal leaders um, might um, be central in a network, but not necessarily administrators. Formal leaders might be coaches or something like that. 
Um, it also can be shaped by opportunities to interact, such as um, uh, grade level meeting teams, that sort of thing. Uh, the more uh, a particular interaction is perceived as legitimate or particular behavior, that can heighten interactions along those lines. And there's interesting new work from uh, coming out of the MIST 2 project uh, uh, referring to that and, and the pressure on standardized tests and how it can shape value, the pursuit of people with high value added. Okay, um, I'll go on. So some byproducts of networks uh, can be effects on commitment to teaching, distributed leadership, maybe achievement. There's some work actually relating networks to achievement, but here I would suggest that you know these are delayed effects, long lags. Don't affect a network. Don't expect a network effect to drive a change in achievement next year, but it's a long-term enduring thing. Okay. Um, the sort of home, bringing home point here is that the networks within an organization of the school sit in a larger institutional context. And that institutional context can shape a lot of the interactions that occur and the results of those interactions. It brings together those two things at the beginning of the talk. The organizational theorists were aware of institutions and how they might uh, pertain. And the educational researchers pay a lot of attention to what goes on inside the school. And the networks are something that can filter, uh, and, 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 yeah, filter a lot of those external processes for how they shape the school. And so I'll give an example here from a paper Bill and I had about uh, NCLB, uh, but I think it's a more general phenomenon. So you have NCLB uh, could be the external institution uh, up here that uh, is trying to change teachers' behaviors, and it ticks, uh, it knocks a couple of people here. They change their behaviors. The bigger the ring here, the more the teacher was inclined to engage in NCLB uh, at sort of a baseline time point. And what can happen is, uh, as teachers respond to their normative pressures, what's going to happen is there's no little tick here hitting this group down here. You'll get teachers within their little clusters conforming to one another, and over time, NCLB can drive a wedge between the teachers in these two groups and the teachers down here who did not have a strong normative uh, component and who were not exposed necessarily to the pressure. So the irony of this is that NCLB was intended to be this uniform press for, for you know, uh, opportunities for exposure, um, no child left behind. And the irony is if there were pre-existing groups in the school um, and they, there's normative pressures, then it could, NCLB could actually create a wedge that would drive the teachers in separate directions. And now you come along with your new reform and you complain the school is not coordinated. They're dysfunctional. Uh, and, and what happened? There was something that was there before you that forced them apart, that pushed them apart. So our network dynamics can help us understand this phenomenon um, um, as, as the teachers interact with each other, influence each other, and select who they interact with uh, uh, in response to these external institutions. That's a good place for me to stop. I want to leave plenty of time because I'm anxious to hear the rest of the talks, uh, so I'll turn it over to the next one. How do you like it so far? <laughs> so I'll rub it in. <laughs> it always does. This is actually from Rochester, believe it or not. Uh, this is, uh, the ocean just off the side of Rochester. Many of you might not know about that. <laughs> This is why we're partners here. <laughs> okay, good afternoon. We're really happy you're here. We know you have a lot of choices when you come to ARA and we're glad you selected us. <laughs> thanks for being here. And thanks to Ken and the organizers and uh, all of you for coming on this afternoon. My name is Alan Daly. I'm at the University of California, San Diego, and I'm joined by my fabulous colleague, Kara Finnegan. Hi. 
who has a house right overlooking the ocean in Rochester. And we just want to indicate that this uh, work is supported by the WT Grant Foundation, uh, who's been very generous in support of our work and just all around great folks. So what we're going to talk to you about is this idea about churn. So we're going to get more into detail about what that is, but we're going to look at the relationship between network churn and district leadership. Ken did a really nice job at sort of outlining what we know about schools and a little bit into administration. This entire study is going to be about district level administrators and site principals. So we're not going to give you a whole bunch of theoretical frame behind it. We're going to kind of just go through that quickly. You can read the paper to find more of that, but we just want to set a general context. So here we go. There are increasing accountability demands on schools and districts to really transform and improve practices and the work that's going on within schools. And in doing that work, schools and districts are drawing on research evidence of a variety of different types. In addition to research evidence, they're also drawing on a lot of data, all sorts of different kinds of data. And these change efforts themselves, they can ebb, they can flow very beautifully, but most importantly, they can really be disrupted by network churn. Okay, and let me see. What we mean by churn, just so everybody's on the same page, are people both exiting the system, and our system is the organizational leaders in a district. They're entering the system, they're changing positions. So we, they remain in the network, but they're moving around within the network. And what we know from that movement is that there results in capital costs. And of course, there are human capital costs. We hear much more about these. Um, we, but we also know that there's a loss of expertise and knowledge when churn happens. And there's a lot of institutional memory that can also be removed from the system or coming and going. And one of the things that we read about churn, most of the writing is about the fiscal cost, fiscal capital cost, or the human capital cost. And much less attention is paid to the social capital cost. And that's really what Karen and I are looking at in this particular paper. And as you heard from Ken, and we're going to hear from a lot of our other colleagues, there's quite a lot of potential in these social relationships, <laughs> even for minions. Uh, these social relationships can really enable us to realize important goals. And one of the goals that we're really interested in this particular study is this idea around organizational learning and really digging deeper into single and double loop learning. And so in doing this work, we're gonna explore churn using social network theory and methods. So we start out uh, just sort of doing a little quick teaching because we all know you might not all be experts in social networks here. So this is a school that uh, Karen and I have spent some time in called the Elsinore School. And you can see it's got quite a lot of characters here. We've got somebody named Hamlet. We've got a couple grave diggers. We've got Claudius. We've got a queen. And what we're looking at here in this particular study is we're interested in central actors. So actors that have high in degree and out degree. So in degree is incoming ties, out degrees are outgoing ties. We're also interested in this idea about brokers or betweenness. These are people that connect otherwise disconnected actors. They play very important roles in systems. The other piece that we're really interested in is this idea about fragmentation. So how fragmented would a network be if a few actors were removed from that network? So what we're talking about today is part of a larger study that we've been doing for a number of years now. This is just one urban district that we're going to show you data from. Uh, this is one that had two superintendents over three years. That's not that surprising. Many districts have even more. Um, but this resulted in a 33% churn rate among these <coughs> leadership positions. And just to clarify again, we're talking about central office leaders who are directors and above, as well as all the principals in the district. And, and a 22% leadership turnover. So you hear much more about the leaving part of churn, and that's turnover. But if you think about it all of the in and out, that's what we're talking about in terms of churn. So there was a data initiative underway, and that's part of why um, we, we asked some questions around data use. And we have three years of our own data from these leaders. So it's a longitudinal study, but today we're just showing you a point in time. 
All right, so what data, what kind of data do we collect? We have social network data that we're gonna be talking about today. We also have um, some constructs around organizational learning, as Alan mentioned, that's one of the things we're thinking about, about the, the change that's happening within, these, within this district in particular. And then of course, some demographic data. And we talk a lot about um, the relationships as in terms of what flows among these underlying networks. And so you can look at instrumental or work-related networks. You can look at a whole lot of different things that throw, flow through these relationships. Today we're talking about these. There's also more emotional kinds of relationships. So the two things that we're focusing on today have to do with expertise. Who do you turn to for, who's a reliable source of expertise? And data use. Who do you turn to for advice? and using data to improve student achievement. And we're gonna talk about some different analytic strategies we use in terms of in degree, out degree. These are the kinds of things that we use um, our software to help us analyze. And we'll show you some of these in the maps. So overall, one important message, I guess, in all, in all of our work and, and in other work as well, is that there's very sparse ties in networks in, in central, between central office and schools and within central office. And so I'm gonna show you a little bit about what I mean by that. This is our, okay, so I have a lot to say. This is our central office leaders. We call them a district leadership network. Um, these are, every dot represents a person. And I wonder if it can go this far. Can you see anything? Yeah. Anyway. Um, no. Oh, what did I do? Sorry. Oh, we got to start over. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that wasn't the button. That wasn't the right button. Sorry about that. Um, I'll just keep talking though. So they're clustered by different zones or areas in this district. And so um, in the central office is the center. Thanks. Everybody in the central office are the central office leaders. And then on the round them are the clusters of principals along with the central office leader. One thing that you might see right away is that there are different ties. The lines represent the ties between people and the clusters have different amounts of ties. Let me show you a little bit more. Since we're talking about churn today, the yellow dots show you who moved in and out of the system during this three year time period. And so um, this is again, both people who are coming in and people who are leaving and you can see they're not evenly distributed across the different clusters. So for example, it might be hard to see, but area five up at the top has a 43% churn rate compared with area four right next to it with the 10% churn rate. And so these, these groups that are set up formally to connect with each other are having different impacts of this churn. And central office, as you can see, is, is also highly represented in terms of these people moving in and out. We also think it's important to think specifically about newcomers. So then you can sort of break apart churn and who's coming into the organization might have different needs in terms of the, the ramping up that they're doing in their new positions. And you can see again that the newcomers are also not evenly distributed. So as an organization, as a district, you'd wanna be better understanding this churn in and out, especially if you have more people coming in in certain places, that's gonna require some different kinds of supports. So let's talk more specifically about those people that left. So this is really where we see the social capital cost potentially to this system. So let's take a look at this first map. This is a different relationship now. Now we're looking at expertise. We can see that uh, it's much more densely connected. Uh, this just is density is the proportion of existing ties over possible ties. It's still not that densely connected. But one of the things you're gonna notice here is that all the nodes that are blue in color are ones that left over that three year period in which we are collecting data. They are also sized by in degree, meaning that they were sought for expertise. One of the things you can see right now is that nodes that are actually, quite, sorry, Cynthia, I just got this in the back of your head. Uh, you can see these, <laughs> you can see the nodes that are bigger are those ones that are sought for expertise. And those were also some of the same people that left the system. Significant costs in terms of expertise. Secondly, we can look at data use in this one. The nodes are sized by betweenness. Remember, those are actors that connect otherwise disconnected actors. Those in blue in this case are the ones that left the system over the three year period. So what you're losing are people that are being sought for expertise, as well as those that are brokering connections in data use. We also ran this thing called the key player analysis. And so what this tells you is 
if you remove certain nodes, how, dis how fragmented would the system become? And we ran this early when all the people were there. And then what it showed is these key players were the ones that would really fragment the system if they left. And in fact, they left. And so this is really important to sort of think about the social capital costs here. So in, in the paper, we talk more about this, but we just wanted to give you a little bit more sense of who these people who leave are. And so it turns out that these are people who have been in the organization a longer time. They're mostly leaving. That might not be that surprising because you have retirements and things like that. But they also are people who have been in, the, in their position for a shorter amount of time, so which sort of shows you how this leadership movement happens and people are sort of starting over as they move up a ladder potentially, but then have there's some costs associated with that, particularly if they don't stay there very long. Um, they also have lower perceptions of the district as a learning organization. So the people who leave see the district as uh, less risk-taking, um, less supportive in terms of having new ideas and practice and the sharing collaborative relationships and things like that. Uh, we also find in terms of, Alan alluded to this a little bit already, but the ones who leave are the ones who are the most sought for expertise. So this is a really important group of people who are, who are sort of the people with knowledge that people turn to, but then they leave the system. And so what happens after they leave? It's a really important question. And they also, as Alan said, they're the ones who are the connectors. And so if you have the people who are connectors leaving, it causes fragmentation as a result. Okay, so we're bringing it home here. Here are the big takeaway messages. Leavers tend to be this reliable source of expertise and off they go. The bridges and brokers tend to start disappearing <laughs> over this period of time. This results in potentially some of these high capital, social capital costs that may undermine the overall social structure. And in some ways, as uh, Kara alluded to, creates this revolving door of leaders. And so it really just wouldn't be right unless we left you, left, unless we left you with a picture of the beach. So our next steps are dig more deeply, qualitatively, and look across some of our other districts. This is more stuff you can read if you don't have enough to read already. And thank you for your time. Good afternoon. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted, and it's, we still we still have a day to go. Um, this uh, is not the title that appears in the program. Uh, we do change our minds every now and again. Uh, the paper, the title in the uh, program. There's a paper for that. It's available. Contact me if you want it. And this was. Uh, uh, an early version of a book chapter, and we can also share that with you if you're interested. Basically, uh, what Megan Hopkins, my colleague from Penn State, uh, sitting here in the front row, uh, and I decided to do was to try and stand back and ask ourselves, uh, having over the last decade or so been consumers of SNA theory and methods, uh, to reflect on what we thought from our perspective, studying reform, studying schools as organizations, studying school leadership, um, what were some of the challenges we saw? And um, I should say I don't consider myself an SNA expert. I have relied on the generosity of many of the people here uh, on the panel, uh, for which I'm uh, very uh, grateful over the last uh, decade or so. Um, as uh, Ken pointed out, oh, it works. As Ken pointed out, uh, you know, uh, SNA has uh, has quite a long history uh, in education, uh, which I think actually goes back close to the uh, original work using some, some social network analysis. And uh, I, I dare I suggest that there's been something of a revival over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Uh, work on teacher networks, work on policy implementation, school reform, leadership, uh, etc. And uh, I'm not going to go into that. Ken's paper does a very nice job of uh, reviewing um, that literature. Um, instead, what I would like to do is to basically address three kind of perhaps macro issues. Uh, uh, the first has to do with research methods and measures. 
And uh, here I'm going to focus on instrument development and validation work, basically a call for some more of that. Uh, I also just want to say that uh, a, a piece of work that I think we may need to do is uh, not just rely uh, exclusively on standard SNA measures, but also depending on what area we're working on, we may actually have to work on developing measures uh, particular to that area. Uh, the second big issue I want to touch on is research design. And here I want to make uh, a pitch for mixing qualitative and quantitative methods. I'm speaking to the choir on this issue with, res uh, with respect to the panel, but I'm uh, uh, encouraging you all as you become SNA users to uh, think mixed methods. And, and, and also to just simply say that as uh, Alan and Kara's talk pointed out, uh, the really the importance of having longitudinal uh, uh, data. And I want to finish with just uh, saying a little bit about, uh, you know, we're applied social scientists. Uh, uh, part of our work is to surely engage practitioners, policy makers, and SNA uh, actually works very well with that, but there are some, down, there are some downsides, I think, that we should uh, think a little bit about. Actually, I do have my notes. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, so let's start with uh, methods and measures. Um, th th there's not a lot of work in education on uh, efforts to try and validate these instruments for good reason, because this validity work, I think, actually, speaking personally, I find this validity work really dull and uh, laborious. I much prefer to find something exciting. Oh my God, look, there's a connection between this. But the, the validity work can be quite dull. Uh, we've done a little with uh, a former uh, postdoc. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and let us know what you find. Um, but we spent quite a bit of time actually trying to do some validity studies on, on our uh, instrument and uh, the uh, social network instrument that we use has gone through several iterations. Um, the piece that I think uh, that was very, that well, gave me the wake up call for this. In some earlier work, uh, um, I had based, uh, we'd always ask the, uh, this is for elementary school teachers, we'd always ask questions about language arts first followed by mathematics. And I had published some work on that and uh, Lo and behold, we, uh, James Patsyowski, who I don't think is here, but James was working with me at the time, and James said, well, maybe we should see if there's a question order effect. So we did a little study uh, based on 15 uh, public schools, four Catholic schools in Chicago, elementary schools, and 10 public middle schools in Nebraska, where we actually created a, um, an experiment. Uh, two experimental conditions. Uh, this is published, by the way, in uh, the paper will come up in the next slide. Um, in the first condition, this is the survey now done online, so we can randomly assign the ordering of the questions. So in the first condition, uh, the teacher or the school leader is asked about mathematics first and then asked about the reading question. And in the uh, second treatment condition, reading first, math second. And uh, I was shocked and dismayed to find that, well, indeed, there is an effect. That when you ask the mathematics question first, under that math reading, uh, this results in people reporting fewer people for language arts. In other words, there's either a, a priming or satisfying effect going on. And in fact, our qualitative data bears this out. Teachers tend, elementary teachers, at least in our work, tend to seek out fewer people for advice and information about mathematics teaching uh, compared uh, to language arts. Um, so this caused huge uh, upset in my research lab. Uh, how are we going to deal with this? Um, when, when you look at the literature, um, uh, there are various ways in which you could go about it. You could rand always randomly assign the ordering of the questions. Um, but actually what we decided to do was to ask a very broad question first. I, I can't remember the exact wording, but now I think we ask, who do you go to for advice uh, and information about curriculum, teaching, students? Uh, generate as many names as possible around the core technical work of teaching. And then we repopulate those names into the survey and we ask, do you go to this person for 
mathematics, language arts, science, etc. So that was the, the most recent iteration of our instrument. All of this by way, uh, one important part of the work which we hope you will do uh, is really to think seriously about our instruments. If you, you notice we ask our questions in slightly different ways and I think these issues are important uh, as we move forward as a field. Um, research design. Um, this uh, uh, basically here I'm going to refer to two studies. Uh, the first study is based on Cloverville. Uh, this paper is actually published in AERJ with uh, Chong Min Kim and uh, Ken Frank. And the second uh, study is based on two school districts in Nebraska. Uh, uh, both, uh, all of the work is in elementary schools and uh, I won't say any more about the methods for now, but uh, you can read about them uh, in the papers. Uh, the question, as Ken pointed out, the question we asked in the Cloverville study, um, there's a lot of work about the returns from ties, the returns from social networks, but much less work on why people go to particular people for advice and information. And that's really important if we want to figure out how do you build social capital? How do you build connections? So Ken and Chong Men and I began to say, well, a necessary, uh, if insufficient condition for developing social capital is the existence of a tie. So what factors might be associated uh, with a tie? And in this paper, uh, I think it was, it's 2012, I think, I can't even see. Yeah, 2012, um, in ARJ, we find uh, evidence that individual characteristics, uh, same gender, same race, are significant but small effects. But the big story is that the formal organizational structure matters. Uh, being in the same grade level, professional development, uh, formal leadership position are, are really important predictors. And as Ken said, uh, that might be obvious, of course, uh, any teacher could tell you that. Um, but I think if you think about it as a school administrator uh, or as a school reformer, uh, it has important implications about how do you distribute teachers across grades, across time. In a more recent uh, paper just uh, out under review, we asked the same uh, question in a new data set, but we look at both within school ties and between school ties. Uh, this is just a representation of the between school ties in one school district, uh, language arts on the left, mathematics on the right. Big story uh, with respect to in-school ties, similar to the AERJ paper, although there's not a lot of racial diversity in Nebraska among teachers, so we have a gender effect but no race effect. Um, but between school ties, as, uh, as we represent here, formal leaders, both math leaders uh, and language arts leaders, as well as uh, uh, generic administrators like principals, are really, really central in the between school ties. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is that this leaves us with a lot of questions like, so, and we couldn't answer this in the ARJ paper because we had no interview data. Why is grade level important? And you may all say, of course, people are located next to one another, maybe. Um, they teach the same curriculum. Yes, that may be a very important reason, but there are also other potential explanations. And you might ask, why is formal position important? Hierarchy? You go to people up the line. If you know anything about schools, that's not always the case, right? So in this study, uh, what Megan and I did, this is a paper with Tracy Sweets, by the way. Um, what we did was we have 34 uh, teachers across five schools, teachers and school leaders that we purposefully sampled based on their position, based on how central or how periphery they were to the network. And what's striking here um, is that we begin to unpack through the qualitative interview data. We not only support, but we extend our argument about how and why formal structure is so important. What's striking is that uh, expertise is critical in decisions to who to, for whom to seek out for advice and information in a particular curricular domain. And uh, for teachers and school leaders, the particular formal position signals expertise, as does participation in both school level and district level organizational routines. This is what a psychologist calls transactive memory, uh, that people encode externally, 
and organizations, in quote, externally, to assigning people to positions, to giving them uh, titles, etc. The second thing that the qualitative data allowed us to do here uh, was to begin to unpack about the importance of grade level. And about half of the uh, 32, 34 teachers in the sample said, yeah, people are close, next door. Uh, I bump into them in the hall, right? Uh, but at the same time, uh, people began to point out the critical importance of participating in the same organizational routine, the grade level professional learning community routine, that they had time to get together, uh, and, at the, and also the issue of shared responsibility. So it's not just a proximity story. The formal uh, organization works in a variety of ways to signal um, particular, uh, to signal particular uh, notions about expertise. I'm gonna skip the uh, little piece of qualitative data. It's not that I don't like qualitative data. People that know me know I love it. But I do wanna get to the last slide and I'm getting afraid of men up here. She's beginning to uh, give me a nasty look. So um, I just, do, I do wanna talk about very briefly development work. Um, in our work in Nebraska, in our work in Chicago, uh, in part as an effort to coax and cajole schools to participate in our work, we promise every school a report every year on what we find. And actually schools really, and, and policymakers, especially district policymakers, really like network data. It appeals to them. Uh, these pictures, it, it grabs their attention, and they love to be able to see the changes across time. Um, so there's something about SNA, I think it has a, a huge developmental uh, uh, um, way of engaging practitioners with thinking about the school as an organization, thinking about change. At the same time, I think the pictures uh, can be easily misinterpreted. You know, people say, oh, that person's central because they're right at the center of the map, when in fact that may not at all be the case. So there's a downside to it also. The, perhaps the biggest challenge, I think, in using SNA is the confidenti confidentiality issue, because when you share a network of a school, uh, people can say, oh, I know who that is. So you have to go uh, through a whole series of efforts to camouflage who's, how many people, you know, we can't say this is third grade teachers because only two third grade teachers. So we have early primary, late primary. Um, but I think it's important as we move forward as a field to begin to capitalize on and try and overcome uh, some of the challenges in using SNA in our development work as well as in our research. Thank you. A lot more here. So I'm going to actually pick up where Jim left off with um, talking a little bit about development work. Uh, though it's not a direct application of social network analysis results to the process of supporting change, but rather an application of <coughs> all of the insights generated by the people on this panel uh, over the last decade or so in, the, in the, what Jim's calling the revival of social network analysis. Um, I'm also going to talk about this in the context of planning for implementation of the next generation science standards uh, with the work that I'm undertaking with colleagues at the Exploratory and University of Washington EDC and Turk, along with actually SRI and Inverness Research Associates. And it's focused on research use, but I'm gonna problematize that um, right away uh, because many of the ways that we think of research use, how will we move research into practice so that great findings from research can ha have an in the influence they, quote, should have on practice. But rather, um, that actually flies in the face of, of how people actually make decisions and how research figures into that process. So if we, and part of understanding research use is a deep understanding of networks, which is uh, a lot of the focus of the work currently funded by William T. Grant across a, a few projects that are represented here. Um, and that's not just me and this panel saying this. This is a conclusion of a recent National Research uh, uh, Council report uh, 
on using evidence as science that really underscores the degree to which research use is a rhetorical persuasive process. It involves interaction uh, and accommodation. There is mutual adaptation of research and practice is really core to the work. So how can, uh, and so how do we begin to think about that and how do we use network ideas to do that? Well, the work that I'm talking about is situated within a family of, of approaches and new approaches to working in partnership between research and practice as a means of supporting uh, not just research use, but really educational transformation writ large. Uh, and so these are some of the examples and names that go by it. My name for it is design-based implementation research. What they all have in common is a much more collaborative relationship between research and practice. Um, the, some of them explicitly make use, and these are just actually a range of kinds of issues that are making use of networks to guide change. If you heard Tony Bright speak, for example, today, you heard him talk at his presidential session talking about network, the, harnessing the power of networks for change across di geographically distributed area, areas. Uh, Kira Baker Doyle, who's a researcher here uh, in the area, has actually tried to start to think about how do we network teachers together and use the concepts from building social capital there. And then I have this picture down in the lower left because we're um, play people who are trying to explore this. And I would say they don't, they're not as far as you might imagine in trying to look at for example, obesity. How do we actually take our understanding of the role that social networks um, play in obesity and turn that into um, uh, interventions? Um, and, but that is an area in health where similar work is going on. Um, so the work I'm talking about is in the context of a support grant for math, math and science partnerships funded through the National Science Foundation. And we are, our, our purpose is to actually develop and test various models for changing the relation of research and practice. The collaboratory is really organized as a series of design experiments or design research studies at scale. So we work with different kinds of organizations um, and we're very purposeful in the organizations that we work with uh, to try different ways of relating research and practice and I'll talk about that more. Um, one of the characteristics of design research is that it's, uh, it is uh, the f a process of building and engineering new conditions for learning and uh, doing research on the means to support them. And that has to be guided by a couple of things, one of which I'll focus on today. One is a set of specific conjectures, which are a little bit like claims or propositions in organizational study, but they're different in the sense that they are meant to do some work for us in terms of helping us guide design. In design-based research, we think about designs as embodying particular connections about learning that are reified in organizations of support. They are derived from extant knowledge and theory, and I've drawn, in, and I'm gonna give you name some here, uh, but from the research here, and they, their empirical refinement is not just intended to lead to the improvement of a particular learning design, but also potentially to refinements to the theory itself. Typically, these conjectures are about classroom learning. And the move that the projects that we're doing is to also think about organizations as a layer. Um, so I'm gonna briefly just mention, and there I'm ha happy to share a paper, and I'll just mention some of the research that underlies each of these. But one insight from recent work by Peg Gertz and colleagues and others is the role of state, net of state networks in particular in um, supporting research exchange. And so one of the recommendations that they make that hasn't necessarily been explored is how do we make exist use of existing professional associations to actually influence the use of research among uh, state leaders? And so that's work that underlies this very first conjecture. Cynthia's work as, as uh, with Jen Russell, Jim's work, uh, Min and Ken and my work, all point to the importance of high depth interactions. The, when we want to talk about complex practices transformations, there's no such thing as a strength of a weak tie. There are only things that, and there's also the necess necessity for expertise in the network. So if there's not the relevant expertise, you will not get change. So that's an important piece of this. Finally, is some work that I think is inspired really by Alan and Kara's work is to look at the importance, you saw those um, changes and churn, 
Uh, their work also points to the need for boundary spanners between researchers and practices, provided that they can actually link, again, provided they can link the people and resources. And finally, their work too, but also any, again, people who work in districts and schools, realize that there are gaps between the district level and the, and the school level. So uh, one approach to that is something called multi-tiered partnerships, uh, which my student, uh, Sam Severance, who's here, is working on developing, a, a helping to articulate what exactly those kinds of things look like. So where are we do, lo, doing this work? Well, one, we've begun a line of work in the collaboratory with the Council of State Science Supervisors. This is a network of leaders uh, in all states who have been focused on building capacity around um, the framework for K-12 science education, which is not, that is the precursor to the standards. Um, they're very welcoming researchers. Their initiative has not just included the 50 states, but they've had a series of meetings over the past two years involving more than 700 people from teams that the states brought that are all engaged in work. And our goal of working in there is to, and they're reformulating, I just came from this conference, into a set of working sessions. And the collaboratory was supporting by building some ties with relevant expertise. So we linked people who are experts in curriculum and instruction to um, a committee that's working on identifying relevant resources. So we have a conjecture map that guides this work. And so this is uh, a lot like if you, you would see a, similar to a driver diagram in the networked work. Um, but you can see how we have our conjectures over here and how are these embodied in different things. Well, we have, there are certain discursive practices that where the researchers engage in very anchored discussions of problems of practice that are driven by the state network people, not by us. That's important to know. This collaborative planning structure where a researcher is paired with two state leaders to lead these committee, uh, committee, committees working on identifying resources. And our role in that is to help identify some relevant research. But again, it's, a, it's framed as collaborative uh, planning. Um, we do, as researchers, they, the states expect us to come in and be the experts, too. Sometimes partnership means being called on upon for your expert in a, in a traditional talk, just like the one I'm giving. Um, also, they have us serve on advisory groups. Um, and then these meetings that are happening. We have various planning tools um, uh, that are very specific to help orchestrate that work, like a team charter. Um, we prepare research briefs and practice briefs, which are, which are their analog, and that's a means to actually infuse the work that we're doing with them. And the goal here is to really support some higher level of engagement, um, and we hope that in the short term they seek us out for advice and input into ongoing work and collaborative sense, and that they support collaborative sense making all with the um, support of the implementation of standards. That's not all we do. I mean, if that, one of our other experiments is actually much more focused on in-depth partnership work. This is work led, co-led by uh, Dan Gallagher, the Seattle Public Schools curriculum manager, uh, and my colleague Phil Bell at the University of Washington. Um, and it's organized as a multi-tiered partnership that links the district and school levels, meaning they have governance structures that are both about the district level partnership with researchers and co-design teams that involve teachers to, in order to try to coordinate across levels and span these boundaries. They work, I think, and it's very important to say, in an extremely supportive state policy environment for their work in terms of their state coordinator who, who I work with on this other line of work. Oops. So just briefly to talk about the, their conjecture map focuses much more on collaborative uh, learning. I apologize for the size of these things. These things tend to be large, um, these conjecture maps. Um, but there's shared learning about practice-focused instruction. I want to talk about that, uh, that participation structure and discursive practice. They actually recognize a number of them. Uh, the science standards now have engineering. They did not have expertise in the system. And so one of the things they have as, as sort of a discursive practice is an explicit time to learn about new things related to next generation science standards that nobody there knows and bring in expertise, but also do reading and sense making work. Um, their collaborative design and, and instructional materials is a really core practice in, uh, here. Um, there's very little money for textbook adoption as we roll out these new standards. So in math, some of us have observed 
the wild world of the internet, of the search for new resources. So what this work is trying to do is to purposefully support adaptation of adopted materials um, as both means of professional development, but also as a means to generate new materials uh, with the aim that, um, uh, that it will support change, professional, uh, professional learning and understanding as well as better instructional materials and practices. Sorry, these arrows are a build. Um, go back for a second. And the aim here is not just sort of, a, it is, in, it does include a sort of uh, an impact on student learning so that we can develop the kinds of science proficiencies that are expected and reflected in the standards. But again, one of the things to connect this briefly back to networks, the work is really purposeful about who's involved in this, in this co-design process based on the expertise they bring. And then this adaptation work really supports high depth interaction uh, that makes use of that expertise. So it's not just that the relevant expertise is at the table, but how are we using it through the iterative process of design and study of implementation? A kind of final work, and this is um, some of this we are doing, and some of it I will be quite honest, we are, don't have the resources to do. But what would I, you know, how do we actually investigate these conjectures? And this is where we come full return. We come back to our network methods as a means to actually investigating these. So um, part of it is to what extent is the, is the CS cubed group, the state science, how are they better networked to researchers and how, who are effective? I think the conditional there is important, who are effective in helping them access relevant and useful research uh, for their work. Um, and which interactions, and like because not all of them will, are of sufficient depth to support meaningful appropriation of research, meaning, and I say appropriation and making one's own and actually adapting it as appropriate. Catalyzing new partnerships. So part of our intention in our committee work is to actually foster identification of potential partners. How do they change, and this is really important, this way of working I think has the tendency, if, uh, if researchers will allow it, to change their identities and practice, like how they go about research, and that's really important. And finally, in the adaptation work, we want to see, you know, to what extent does this co-design work help the district leaders span the bound boundaries within central office that's needed? And this is a huge obstacle uh, in these design efforts because central office represents a pretty, uh, our, our central offices in urban districts are themselves complicate, com complicated or complex networks. And finally, in the adaptation work, how well does, in, does interaction within the partnership succeed in surfacing and addressing the tensions among the different researchers, district leaders, and teachers. And that actually requires, again, a sort of mixed method approach um, that we're doing in some of this work to actually try to name the design tensions and how they get taken up uh, and how these might relate to network position uh, within these partnerships. So we're back full circle, I think, as we think about what is the implementation evidence that we would begin to use to refine our conjectures in a design-based research mode. Um, and that, that's, a, that's an extension, both, I would add, of both the policy implementation research that we've been doing uh, in networks, uh, the people on this panel, but also in a, a series, a big extension of design research. So I know it's nap time, <laughs> and uh, I don't have any pictures to show you, so I don't know. I don't know how this goes. I'll, I'll try to be short and sweet, but that's not, those of you who know me, that is not my strength. So, um, um, so thanks for coming, um, and thanks for all your interesting work. Um, I think it's really funny that I'm the discussant for this panel because I'm probably the latest to social networks of all of these folks and I mainly I've learned a lot from these guys so we'll see if you all have created a monster here yeah. um, so um, you know as Ken and Jim have pointed out this is in education this is a new body of work really um, there's like a few people here and there who have been doing this work for a long time um, and then really all of a sudden people are there's a lot of new actors and they're collaborating and they're learning from each other and some of this comes from some field building work that people on this panel and others have done where they've brought 
those of us who are starting to do this work together to learn from each other in organized ways. Um, and I think this has been super productive. I mean, I think we could do a little case study on um, the development of this field of work within education um, because it's led to the development and application of um, greater sophistication in our use of methods, um, as well as um, greater um, conceptual and theoretical development and really thinking hard about new kinds of questions that this set of um, theory and methods can lend insight to. Um, some of these sort of new methodological approaches and new conceptual things I think were reflected on the panel today. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the set of ideas presented here, um, point out a couple things um, they highlight for me, and questions they raise for me, and then if I have time I'm going to sort of meditate a bit on future directions um, that I hope the field will go. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is um, mechanisms of attachment or um, sort of what predicts tie formation. And as Jim points out, ties are the building blocks of social networks. So if we understand more about how and when individual teachers opt into relationships with one another, we can understand how um, networks come to have the particular structures and qualities that they have. And this is important because these structures and qualities um, are related to the kinds of outcomes that we see, whether that be implementation, greater learning, um, fragmentation, um, you know, various things. And networks have these different qualities, and if we're trying to understand how and why, we need to understand these logics of attachment or tie formation process. Um, as both Jim and Ken's presentation highlight, we now have a very long list of predictors of tie formation, um, which is great. But it seems to me what we really need to know and start to be able to do in this field is, is start to understand when and under what conditions which predictors are salient. Is it the nature of the network? Um, might you see teachers, for example, reaching out to others um, for different reasons or there being different things about the social structure that predict it for a gossip network versus a collaboration network versus an advice network? I don't know. Might be interesting to find that out. Um, or might they vary uh, um, with the nature of that, the activity? So for example, a lot of us here have studied the role of social networks in implementation. Well, how does the thing, the, the nature of the task we're implementing, influence the logics of attachment? Um, also, where are we in an implementation process? Might these, might these predictors of tie formation shift over time? Um, a lot of the research on this um, sort of makes claims about this being a predictor and their cross-sectional cross um, studies. How do these, how do the logics of attachment or tie formation process shift over time? And then the, the, the other thing that I think, um, and both Jim and Ken um, uh, talked about this when they talked about it, but I think it's really important to also think about the ways in which these factors um, interact, but perhaps are even conditional upon one another. So sociologists suggest that individual choice is embedded in and conditioned by the social context. Um, it could be the social context of the network itself. It could be the social context of the organization, things like role and grade level, and um, the kinds of ways in which it's appropriate to interact given um, a given role. Um, it could, in my work, I've looked a lot at how the policy environment influences um, tie formation. Jim was talking about the role of organizational routine. But while we know the context matters for tie formation process, we know less about how these contexts interact with these other predictors that, that we know are also important. So for example, does race matter more in certain kinds of organizational um, arrangements, certain kinds of routines? Does expertise matter more depending on certain conceptions of roles, certain um, certain um, environmental conditions, like the pressure from No Child Left Behind, just as an example. And so it seemed to me like uh, that we need to learn a whole lot more about how logics of attachment change over time, um, and also um, the ways in which they um, interact with one another and maybe are conditional um, upon one another. The second thing I want to talk about is, um, while Jim and Ken focus on the logic of attachment, Karen Allen's paper um, is about what um, Bert calls decay of social networks. Um, who leaves networks? How do ties get um, broken? And I was, exceeded, I was excited to see this paper because there's this growing emphasis 
um, on the logic of attachment, but very, very few people investigate patterns of decay. But this is at least as important in understanding the predictors of, in helping us understand why networks have certain kinds of forms as understanding the logics of attachment. Um, and Alan and Kara highlight some really interesting patterns here. Folks who left played super important roles in expertise and data use networks. They had a high centrality, they were key brokers. And they also um, help us understand, um, they, they give us some hints about why um, these folks might have left, um, that, that they emphasize less in this presentation. There's more of that in the paper. Um, the fact of churn at the top of major, major urban school districts is well known, and I think most people think this is sort of a bad thing, but this analysis really helps us understand in pretty specific ways about what the cost is. Um, the loss of those with great centrality, the brokers, um, those with expertise. My guess is there's also implications for um, political power and coalition building that, that you didn't talk about as well. Um, and Bill and I know from the study that we have together that there's enormous costs for um, relationships with external partners and um, a, 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 trying to attempt to bring external expertise to bear on helping districts solve their problems. And anybody who's done any work as an outsider with school districts know, you know, knows, knows this point. Some questions about this. I'm, I'm curious. Um, I know that you've done work in multiple districts um, in, in this study and the bazillion other studies you guys are doing. Um, and um, I also know that this district is especially well known for churn, um, as is current districts that I spend a lot of time. I'm, I'm in Chicago right now, also well known for churn. Um, so I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering the, the way that some of these dynamics, the particular bad things that are happening um, in this particular context, I, I guess I would encourage you to, to look at this question um, in different kinds of districts with different kinds of characteristics. For example, in districts with a little bit more stable population, often there's a lot of um, intra-organizational churn. So they're not leaving the district. They, you know, Districts just like to reorganize. So there's a whole lot of reorganization. Um, how does that impact the kinds of processes and outcomes of networks that, that you're thinking about? Um, but at the same time, um, what are the reasons that that, that happens? Um, to what degree does this interrupt networks or enhance networks in pr particular ways? Um, some, you know, you could imagine creating new sorts of pathways in very exciting ways because all of a sudden somebody moves from one office to another and then that creates sort of a, a tie. Anyway, so there's, there's sort of a lot of interesting things I think that um, can be built upon there. Um, I want to talk a little bit about mechanisms of influence in social networks. This is something that Ken writes a lot about, um, and he talked about it here. Um, and in the social network literature, there's a lot of discussion about what are the pro we know that social network <coughs> configuration and quality um, predicts some very important kinds of outcomes that those of us who care about schools, care about like implementation, learning, all these good things. Um, but what's the process by which these outcomes are produced through social networks with particular kinds of um, con qualities and configuration? And there's a lot of writing about this. Some people talk about how people gain knowledge from one another through social interaction, and this is sort of a learning explanation. Some people talk about social networks facilitate coordination and collective action. Um, or there's the normative stuff that Ken highlighted here. People feel pressures um, to conform. Ken particularly likes the normative pressure explanation. <laughs> I particularly like the learning explanation. Um, and I would note that um, it takes longer to diffuse complex things, which you pointed out. To me, that suggests a learning explanation, I would point out. Um, but I think that most people would acknowledge, including me and Ken, that these various mechanisms are all plausible. So the question then is, when and under what conditions is, what me would, uh, is which mechanism likely to predominate? So, and as a field, I don't think we really know how to think about this. Um, reading these papers, and in some cases, PowerPoints that I got, um, next to one another, I began to wonder whether the tie formation process might play a role in this. For example, might the mechanism of influence differ when teachers or others seek one another out for, for one reason versus another? Or also might it um, differ depending on the kind of network? Again, a gossip network versus an advice network. You're, uh, my hunch is you're likely to see some different mechanisms going on. 
Might there be something about the organizational context, organizational norms or policy pressure, for example? In general, um, these mechanisms are the black box of social networks. Um, and it seems really important that we begin as a field to develop and employ methods that can help us start to untangle this issue. Um, because then it really helps us understand more about how and why networks of particular configurations behave in the way that they do. Um, finally, I wanna talk about social networks design and development. And as Bill pointed out, there's um, a couple papers that actually talk about this, but in different ways. Um, the differences between using the products of social network analysis as a tool for organizational development versus um, using the research on social networks as a tool of design um, to use to design networks in ways that um, move this work forward. And something that comes out a lot more in the paper than in the presentation is that Bill really focuses in his work on sort of three aspects of social network. He argues that it has implications for structure. Um, he argues that um, social networks uh, that are going to be productive for the particular ends he's interested in um, should be designed to build on existing networks and leverage boundary spanners. Um, he highlighted a lot that there's particular kinds of interactions that are important, but also there, you know, it depends on what knowledge you expect to flow, and in his case, it's research. Um, and I think it's, his paper is really useful because it's really quite a creative way of leveraging research knowledge in the design of a school improvement mechanism. But what's interesting to me about it is it's not, we're used to thinking about drawing on research findings to design like tools and things like this. Um, and that's not what this is about. It's drawing on research findings to design um, an infrastructure of implementation and learning. And I don't think that we all as a field um, think about using research in that particular way. And I think that this paper provides some guidance on ways and ways in which um, we can go about that. And I'm gonna skip my questions because Bill and I collaborate, I can ask him separately. Because <laughs> I just wanna talk about a few like looking to the future things. And I know I'm very close to be out of time, so I will talk faster. No, I'll, I'll skip one. Um, uh, first of all, I think it's time to move up and out of organizations, education people. Um, we all know that organizational boundaries are permeable and you only need to spend like a day or maybe, maybe even half a day in a district central office or in a school to notice that there are all kinds of people from outside schools who are in that organization. Um, even more so in the age of social media and as the internet exploded, uh, there's many more sort of virtual communications so people's ties around advice, around expertise, probably around gossip, certainly around gossip, um, all these things that we study are not bounded by the organizational structure. And yet for lots of good reasons, most of the research in public schools um, use a set of tools where they bound the networks artificially by organizational structure. But I think that there's a whole lot of things um, that that keeps us from being able to use. Now Jim and Megan's um, work on intra-inter start to move in that direction, except that you guys are still, if I'm understanding you right, you're looking at inter um, connections between different aspects of a school district, between the district central office and schools, schools to school, et cetera. And yet there's still all these other actors that are um, influencing the, the very kinds of processes that we're looking at. And there's, there's um, okay, I'll, I have a lot of detail on this and that I will skip. Um, all I will say is there's methodological challenges and there's a whole set of really interesting questions we can ask about that. And I think we should start moving in that direction. Um, the second thing I think that I would like us all to do into the future, all of us, um, is um, bringing new theory to bear to extend and bring better explanatory power to this method and analytic tool. I love social capital theory, love social network theory, but I think, you know, like all theory, it has, um, it has its limitations. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I just, I feel, like, um, I feel like we try to make it do too much work. I feel like we try to make it explain too many things. Um, so I, I would really um, push us to really think about um, the ways in which we can bring other kinds of theory to bear. Um, I know Ken and Bill have done some work bringing institutional theory to bear. I think that's a really good start. I think there's all sorts of ways we could push institutional theory. In my work, I've been doing um, some work with Caitlin Farrell where we're trying to think about um, the connections between social network analysis and theories of absorptive capacity, because I think we, we try to make social network theory do too much work around learning. Um, there are things it's ex it explains, there's a whole lot of things it doesn't explain, and yet we kind of try to 
you know, wave our hands and say, yes, this is learning. And so I'd really encourage us to start thinking about integrating this very cool tool, these really important theoretical ideas with some other sorts of conceptual things that help us really explore the potential of social networks to explain these phenomena. Last thing I'm just going to use as a placeholder, I won't um, explain it. We need to be doing some more longitudinal work. Um, almost all of us here have longitudinal data. We all do, right? Anybody not have it? Um, and yet we're, we're not yet, except in some very baby steps, really plumbing um, the potential of those studies. Yet given churn, given the rhythms of the work life in school districts and in schools, these networks are changing so much all the time. And I feel, I'm actually very concerned that we draw fairly big implications about social network data that we collect at one moment in time, when honestly, if we collect it three months later, it might look quite different, never mind um, a following year, which, then open up, that, which would then open up all sorts of understandings about the implications and the importance of networks. Okay, so I didn't just do placeholder there. Anyway, um, super interesting set of work. Thanks for letting me take a look at it. Thank you again to the presenters and to the discussant. We still have about 10 minutes for uh, substantial questions or anything you may interest in. Yes, please. Does this work? Oh, it works. Awesome. Hi, uh, my name is Pierre. Uh, thank you very much for these great illuminating presentations. Whether they had pictures or not, it was all good. Um, I actually have a question that sort of bounces off the last statement you gave. Um, I was also thinking of this aspect of doing more longitudinal studies combined with the questions of how quickly these networks evolve. Uh, we saw that a little bit during the churn presentations. And I would have more of a methodological, methodology, it's a long day. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you, question, um, combined maybe with the conceptual aspect. So if we want to do longitudinal studies, uh, uh, social network analysis and analysis set studies, how would we go about that if, as, if, uh, wait, uh, just, as you just said, if, if uh, there's a change that could be observed every three weeks, every three months? If we just take a study or um, a social network analysis and we, we do it every year, that's actually something we're doing right now in our context, that, that's a lot of interpretation for like two, three points of data or five points of data after five years. Uh, have you any thoughts about how to deal with this rapidly changing uh, uh, networks, these net rapidly changing networks on one hand and how to analyze them over time? I'll just say one thing really quick. Um, I mean, one thing I, I think we need to do some develop, like some methodological development work to figure out. Given, um, I mean, Ken brought up the point. You know, you'd expect change to happen at different rates depending on the innovation. But there's also um, you'd expect, you know, the nature of people's work and the nature of interaction that happens in people's work. Um, influences how often networks change, and I feel like as a field in education specific ways, we need to do some um, sort of methodological development work to develop our understanding about what the appropriate windows of time are for that. I mean, I'll say that, in, and we haven't done that, I don't think, and we could really um, do that and we'd all be, it would help us all the field a whole lot. I mean, the way that I deal with it is I make sure I do it at the same time um, so that from the year to year inferences, you're not you know, comp doing testing season with the fall when teachers are just starting to get to know each other. But that's a, you know, that's like a, that's a, that's a Band-Aid fix. Other thoughts? Um, I'll just add one thing that Alan and I did some work where we were sort of piloting this a little bit to understand how many time periods you might need. And it just brings up some issues around resources and it brings up issues around, um, Willingness. So we did uh, four time periods over one year, and more than that would be difficult. So it's one of those things that, like, what you know, trying to get the precise number also has a burden on the people in schools that it's going to be a tough trade off and took a lot of resources to be doing the kind of work we were doing. So, not a good answer, but I guess just something to keep in mind. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, also, it's, I, I think it's a really important question because it, this is very expensive data to get for the participants as well as for us. Um, and so when we have these kind of data sets, we want to make sure we're mining them as well as we can. Um, so we've got a, I know uh, Ken and Jim, I think, have a paper looking at longitudinal networks, and that came out in ARJ. Karen and I have a paper that came out in ARJ looking at these longitudinal networks too. The churn is a piece of this. But as Cynthia is reminding us, there's just so much more interesting work that can be done around this. And a good colleague, Nikki Molinar, who's in the audience, we've been collecting data this last year at multiple time points, but on much shorter duration to see what that might do. Because as Cynthia is saying, we're just trying to figure some of this out right now and understand it. I'll throw in two quick comments. One is um, Peter Blau wrote some stuff a long time ago in sociology about uh, the density of ties related to the strength of the tie. And here what you would think about is the, um, the duration of the tie relative to its strength. So if you're going to study teachers' closest collegial relations, you could show up every year. They're not going to change too much, my closest colleagues, right? If you're going to ask teachers, you know, who helped you with uh, unit eight of, of the new curriculum, that could be changing very rapidly. So you want to really key off of that. Um, and, and so that would be the first piece. The second piece that, that I'm going to blame Bill for this. But um, I believe that there are uh, underlying social structures in a school that are more stable than the particular ties. So those underlying social structures might be informal subgroups or cliques. So even if your particular ties are changing, most of your new ties are likely to come from within your clique except for some interesting uh, departures, which Cynthia pushes us to consider carefully. When, and Jim, when would you go outside of your clique? When would you break that bond, that mold? And that's really interesting, but a lot of it will come from home base. And so at that level, it's not quite so dynamic. You could again show up at relatively infrequent intervals and pick off a lot of the interesting action. Any other question? Yes, please. Can I ask? Oh, is me? Hi. Um, so I have a question for <laughs> for Alan. Um, and so uh, I'm I'm really interested in your churn issue, and I know it from the perspective of my colleague Richard Ingersoll. So I'm thinking about what what are some of your intuitions now with this information? How would you how would you apply this now in terms of like you know underserved districts and the the churn issue that you that you and I know well. Probably do this in a chorus, which would be nice. Um, so one of the things that's really important to us, and, and Cynthia hinted at it, is to look at other contexts. So we have actually, as Cynthia was saying, multiple other contexts, some which are much more quote unquote stable, uh, to look at those ideas about changing positions. Because we do notice in all of our urban districts, people are moving around from position to position. So we want to dig really much more deeply into that because we think that might actually be quite interesting. The other bit that we're also been pushing on is in some of our analysis, looking at where the actual turnover is taking place, like is it happening in the program improvement schools or wherever it might be, and how well connected or not connected some of these principles might be. Anything on that? No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Liz take the mic. <laughs> Just a quick comment on the churn. As, as you were presenting, it made me think, um, those with high in degree are leaving, but could having high in degree be part of the reason they're leaving, yeah. right? So, um, and then in my own work, thinking about the brokers as diffusing some of the work of those who have high in degree, right? So the brokers can take some of the pressure off of those who are just getting bombarded by, um, by advice seeking um, individuals. Anyway, my real question was, or <laughs> comment was um, to build on uh, Cynthia's comment, which was to think beyond um, the organization, right? I'd also want to add that it. I think we should think beyond people. Um, the unit of analysis in a network doesn't need to be a person. It can be an organization. It could be research articles, right? Um, it could be vendors. Or in my own work, I've looked at uh, professional development providers in the research space that they use and the absolute lack of any um, relationship between what different providers are, are using. And so just thinking about uh, different modes or, or two-mode networks as one way of building beyond sort of the, the organizational limitations. So. We still have a two or three minutes. So any other? Yes, please, sir. Uh, 
excited or concerned about the administrative appropriation of the IBM networks that are being installed? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to bring up in this context in one of the the costs to worry about um, the work of Lucy Suchman uh, around the, the some of the costs of making work visible. Um, you know, she traces how in the process, and also um, Lee Starr worked on a lot of this work, is the process of codification and making visible the expertise that's informal, it has can often have a cost. Sometimes that folks like being under the radar, for one, but also then that making visible of expertise, yes, it may make available, make them available to others, but again, I think that's one of the uncertainties. So it's beyond just confidentiality. Once we make the, this work visible that is going on, um, how does it get codified? What accountabilities come with it that maybe undercut the um, free, the sort of, there's a gifting that, that is going on when people help each other. And how does that actually take that away? Um, but, and so I think that's one of the double-edged swords. I mean, these all come with trade-offs, I think. I'm going to just add to that, that there's a great irony of Ron Burt's research on structural holes. So structural holes, fill, filling a gap between two, two groups. Um, and th there can be great advantages to filling that gap. The irony is if everybody did it, there would be no more groups and no more gaps. It would be one big fluid pattern of exchange. So the more you follow his advice, the less relevant it could become in any given system. And he knows that. You know, he's very sophisticated about it. But it's an interesting conundrum. Uh, and, and so at some level, we want to know this, but, not, but, but control or influence how people respond to it. With that, I will conclude this panel. And please uh, join me and appreciate the panel for such very interesting discussion about social network analysis. And thank you all for coming.